Hi, I'm Phil Palombi. You're watching ForBassPlayersOnly.com. <laughs> Perfect. Hi everyone, John Liebman here. You're watching ForBassPlayersOnly.com. Today we are on location at Colorado State University at the 2015 International Society of Bassists Convention. And I am here with none other than the one and only Phil Palombi. How you doing, Phil? Great, great. Nice to meet you. Nice to be here. <laughs> well, you've done a lot of a lot of great bass playing with a lot. You, you were with Maynard Ferguson for a while, weren't you? And and uh, Tommy Dorsey. Yeah. And uh, well, at what point did you, uh, you you spent some time in Cleveland, I think, and then eventually gravitated to New York? Can you kind of fill in some of the holes for us? Sure, sure. So I went to Youngstown State and studied with Tony Leonardi there. So I was playing around, you know, Youngstown, and I started working in Cleveland, and then thought I had Maynard's gig, didn't get it, then just dropped, you know, I dropped out of school, moved to Cleveland, and I was only, I was already working there five, six, seven nights a week, but then I got the offer to go out with Tommy Dorsey with Buddy Morrow leading. Incidentally, Buddy Morrow was also Scott LaFaro's first road gig. Which I was, you know, Buddy told me when I was out there. I thought that was funny because I was a Scott fan even then. Uh, do you have anything else to say about Scott LaFaro? Because I know you've been uh, intimately involved in a whole Scott LaFaro situation with the solos you transcribed and the book that you wrote and uh, the bass. And uh, what? Uh, tell us that story. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've always listened to Scott. And I can remember many nights, like after Buddy, I was out with Maynard Ferguson. I've got, then I got the gig for two years and just, you know, intense listening with headphones on the bus all the time and... Actually, when I, when I was going to have my daughter, about three years after in New York, uh, after moving to New York, three or four years in, um, we're having a baby, and I realized, wow, you know, I should probably do some transcribing before the baby gets here, because I'm not going to have a lot of time afterwards. So I started, um, who am I going to do? All right, I'm, I'm going to transcribe some Lafaro. And I did it in college, a couple solos, but let me go back through them. Transcribed one, transcribed another, transcribed a third. Then I just had this mental image of having all the solos on my desk bound at staples you know just like something i did just for me to say man i did this i transcribed every solo of sonnet to vanguard walter debbie all the alternate takes and so i did it just because you know out of love you know i just love that music so much so where are those transcriptions now what became of them all right so then i just thought i'm happy i got my book but at one point i thought well i should buy the book i'm sure somebody's done this and i should compare my work to theirs Started Googling, started Googling, started Googling. Outside of the Chuck Shear book, where he put a couple solos in there. I think Gloria Stepp was in there. Um, is that what's in there? But maybe something else. Nobody done it. I thought, I wonder if I could publish these. You know, I don't. what's involved? I'm not a book publisher. You know, that's your department. <laughs> so what do I know about this stuff? And so I just started Googling, and I said, well, I guess I should probably, you know, ask, you know, find out, you know, if to put the family, you know, who's a family, if you had family, and... And that's when I, you know, long story, but I, I discovered Helene LaFaro on, on the internet. Scott's sister. Scott's sister, Helene LaFaro Fernandez. And I, I guess I just timed it up. You know, Helene is, there's a, a lot of people that always wanted to have something to do with Scott. You know, I'm, she had offers to publish books and, you know, before and that, and she'd, she'd always turn them down. And I think I just caught her at that moment. She felt, you know, it's time. It's not something I needed to do, but I, you know, I offered it. I was like, I, I've transcribed these. It'd be, it'd be really cool if it was in a book, would you know I could publish. But if uh, if you don't want to, fine, that's great. You know, I just, I'm glad I you know I did it just because I wanted to do it. And but they thought no, I'd be you know okay, do it. So then I self published. I you know went into that's a lot of work. It's it? a lot of work, you know. But then also when I realized I was going to publish these solos, I went okay, I'm publishing what is basically the holy grail of bass solos. I better not have a single mistake. So then I went back. At that point, it might have been a year later at that point, and now I found there's applications that will help you slow down music. So I went back through the solos. I slowed them down, and, man, I just completely, like, became anal on every single note in every single one of those transcriptions. That's incredible. Yeah. Uh, Scott's bass has got some notoriety, the instrument itself, or a couple of instruments, and I know you know a little something about that. Yeah, Scotty's bass is uh, 1825 Prescott that is just magical you know, it's just such a great playing bass apparently Scott you know Scott had his bass stolen in LA the story is in Scott's biography actually about he got the bass stolen in LA um, Red Mitchell took him down to uh, Stein on Vine and Red got the, there's two bases Red bought the one with the weird cutaway in the upper bout and Scott got this Prescott but he didn't really like it and he was in New York and he's gonna sell it or something George DeVivier said oh wait a minute I gotta introduce, introduce you to this guy Sam Colstein now, Barry tells a story, Barry, you know, Sam's son, Barry yeah. tells a story that, like, 
So they come in with the bass, and then Scott's in the other room playing some basses. And, you know, Sam's like, you know, who's, you know, oh, so he brought a young kid out here to, you know, check out. And George was like, yeah. And he, Sam kind of looks in the other room, and, and Scott's playing, and he's like, what the hell's that kid doing? <laughs> you know, what, did, what, why, how, you know? Just like he never heard anything like that, you know? And so Sam and, uh, and Scott became really close friends. And Sam, I think Barry said he took about a month. And Sam restored, you know, Sam restored the bass for Scott, and then Scott made it the bass it is now. And it's just, just, just speaks perfectly. And more importantly, Scott wanted to lower the action. To do that with gut strings is, is tricky, right? You don't get a lot of projection that way. So it was a challenge for Sam to work on the bass and set it up in such a way that he could have lower action, but then still project the sound. And it really kind of is the perfect bass for that perfect base for Scott you know you could get in the upper shoulders are sloped nicely as opposed to most Prescott's you could get up in the upper register quickly and it speaks it's, it's loud even if the strings are a little lower what else Phil what else could you possibly want to do other than I mean what else are you ready to take on if anything what about the future well the future for me in a perfect world I I have to play with Chick Corea someday I'm just like those trips like you know of course I'm a complete John Patitucci fanboy in every aspect and I've told him that and I think it embarrasses him because he's so humble <laughs> but you know those records the acoustic band stuff the electric band stuff and and you know I remember the first time I heard Now He Sings Now He Sobs you know Friends Dead Three Quartets Time Warp you know you're speaking my language you know what I mean yeah that's yeah. everything I just love his I've, I've listened to his piano playing so much I just know it'd be one of those instances where playing with him would be like I know right where to put this because I've just listened to him so much so that's one future I mean, you know, I have a trio tri-fi that we tour. We're, you know, we're starting to tour more, more often internationally now. We have five records out, been together 10 years. And those two guys are kind of my Bill Evans and Paul Motion. And, uh, their, their names are? Uh, Matthew Fries and Keith Hall. They're, they know how to interpret my music and accompany, you know. We've been, we were in Curtis Steiger's band together, you know, 110 days a year, 100 gigs a year, 120 gigs a year together with Curtis for five years. And now five records later, I think we really have our own sound. And I feel completely comfortable. I can play anything I want with those guys. You know, that sim relationship. I have another trio called 718 where I put all electric bass. 718. Yeah. Well, it's like the area code in New York where nobody that could afford, you know, nobody could afford 212 Manhattan. Right. So all the artists fled to Brooklyn and the Bronx and Queens. It's that 718 everywhere else. You know, but that project is something that's come together out of my will to want to play with effects pedals. You know, I love, em I love, I love envelope filters and octave pedals and, you know, your occasional distortion pedal. But when you're a side man, you never get to, right. you can't really pull that stuff out. Yeah. So I think, you know, okay, I guess I got to start a trio. Some the pandas from TriFi, uh, get a Fender Rhodes, and there's a the drummer in New York, Eric Halverson. We just started like, okay, let's see what this music is. We just started playing together and started writing musically specifically for this group. And I would write, there's many tunes where I go, there's a tune I call Love Tone, because I finally got a Love Tone envelope filter. And I go, all right, I like the sound of this. I'm going to write a tune. So in this section, I kick in this filter, this pedal, and it's, it fits this tune. And so we have one record out. We're actually tracking another record right now. And it's and a lot of the tunes are like, you're going to hear some crazy sound. It's because I wrote the tune based around a sound, you know, kind of reverse engineered it so the sound makes sense. Well, I am, admire your enthusiasm and your ambition, and we, <laughs> look, we look forward to all that. It's incredible what you've done. Phil yeah, Palombi, thank you so much. thanks. Much luck and continued success to you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for the service of interviews and books, and, you know, you're doing a great service to the bass community. The online archive of interviews is amazing. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And uh, on location at Colorado State University, the 2015 International Society of Bassists Convention with Phil Palombi. I'm John Liebman. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com.